Before factory farming and mass food production, foraging, hunting, and sustainable cultivation was the order of the day. Free-range wild game like turkey, elk, and bison was pretty much the typical diet for most of the original people of North America. While you've probably seen several trends of people going organic and returning back to nature, native people were already living this clean and healthy lifestyle long before it was something to post about on social media. But knowing that there's so much misinformation out there in the pop culture landscape about native food ways, I'm curious, what does indigenous food sovereignty look like today? I'm your host, Cheyenne Barefoot, and this is Sovereign Innovations. How do our ancient practices translate into modern dishes? I went to Wapapa's Kitchen in Oakland, California to speak with owner and chef Crystal Wapapa of the Kickapoo Nation in order to find out. Food sovereignty is just a university word. It's really food is medicine. It really takes place within this restaurant. When it comes to traditional foods, when it comes to bison, this is like one of the first meats. And so I really wanted to try to um, have all game meats in the restaurant only for a purpose is because I want people to see what meats are from this land. For me personally, I always think about what the animal eats and what they represent. And when it comes to the bison, um, they represent so, so many in different tribes. So I'll add a little dried blueberries dried in here. Blueberries. Yes. Uh, and meat, yes, because if you think about what the animal eats, so a lot of game animals, they love eating berries. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and so um, they love, like, there's times when if you go foraging and things, you see a lot of berries, always leave some for the animal. Of course, culinary chefs can adapt the complexities of multiple food items into an exquisite dish. But what if I told you that type of resourcefulness was embedded into every aspect of our communities? Our ancestors' management of what today can be considered waste, bones, hides, eyeballs, guts, is in part because of their understanding of the earth and its cycles. According to indigenous environmental cosmology, native people coexist with nature and living things and serve as stewards of the natural world. That's not just some summer of love, hippie mumbo jumbo that your grandparents were preaching, okay? I mean, like, where do you think they appropriated that from anyway? And specifically for bison, John Lame Deer put it this way, the buffalo was part of us, his flesh and blood being absorbed by us until it became our own flesh and blood. Our clothing, our teepees, everything we needed for life came from the buffalo's body. It was hard to say where the animals ended and the human began. Prior to colonization, the bay served as a channel of communication for various tribes. Villages congregated along creek systems and river mouths. The Ohlone people would cross back and forth across the bay. Today, the land looks much different but the inhabitants are still here. Growing up here in an urban native community, it's something where I felt it was very necessary to have. My kids who are, are California native, it's very important that they see this and they partake in this um, for the future generation. So that's where the sovereignty comes, takes play of us serving foods that are sourced from other native, native communities. So I feel it's very important for people to see where our foods come from and that we're still here and we still exist and how vibrant and beautiful our foods are. It's kind of like your your role as like the matriarch, you know, of the family to just yeah. provide that nourishment. Now that my grandparents and, you know, I have one more living aunt that's left, she's one of our cooks, but um, a lot of family members were coming to me after they had passed to come make um, like our corn soups you know, different dishes like that. And that's where, you know, I felt like, okay, it was passed on to me. When did you start cooking? Like, how long oh, have you been cooking? Probably at age six or seven. My grandfather, he was a hunter. And so, and my grandmother, she always would cook. And so, this is something where I kind of knew at a very young age what I was set out to do. This one right here really reminds me of my grandma. And so, I always try to keep the Kickapoo chili um, on the menu, yeah. and um, even in the summertime, you'll be amazed how many people want chili in the summer. I want chili. <laughs> I am one of those people. I want Kickapoo chili in the summer. <laughs> and, um, so it kind of like it's like having your grandmother here, you know. And so this is an honor to her.
The deep connection between water, land, and people creates an indigenous diet that's composed of both cultivated and wild foods. These foods vary depending on the landscape of the area and the relationship each tribe has with that food item. When it comes into flavoring, and um, I feel that, okay, this accommodates that. I just do things that I like to eat. I really try to source all from Native American-owned businesses, and this is where the part where, to me personally, it gets really fun, and because there's so many, and they're not really recognized as much as we see other um, basic stuff that you see in the stores and things like that. And I've been really fortunate to work with all of them because right. we're moving according to the season and according to what our farms offer. On some levels, it has to be a little challenging to continually be shifting. I didn't come from like a restaurant style background, then I would think it would be really, really challenging. Instead, instead it's, it's like something, nature. yeah, it is. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, let's do this, let's do that. So that's why sometimes if you come to Wapi Pot's Kitchen, you'll see different things on the menu. And I think that this is showing people what's in season and we're just not gonna move into the part, you know, we're gonna provide stuff that are not in season because that's not healthy. Eating by season helps maintain an ecological balance, which we know is part of that indigenous environmental cosmology I mentioned earlier. Food transforms beyond just a need. It deepens the social, physical, and emotional connections for many tribes. It links food to ceremony and the natural cycles of the earth. For example, in the Ohlone tribes, acorns are considered a staple dish. This is in part due to their storability and resource abundance, because of the density of trees in California's landscape. The most popular dish was acorn mush, which may not sound like mush. To achieve a sweetness similar to peanut butter, it goes through a leaching process to remove the natural tannins, which tastes very bitter. Acorns are ground into flour first and then soak under water to remove the tannic acid. When it comes to knowing, I mean really knowing how to handle food and where it comes from, it impacts the communities it's being served to. There's nothing like having a food runner to come and serve your food, knowing exactly where their food comes from and how it's served. You know, sometimes we'll have, um, we have acorn, for instance. Um, my kids are California native. Um, they have a connection with that and you'll be served the acorn and they can actually fill you in where it's from the traditional parts of that. If you notice, I have a lot of berries. Um, I love I, I love foraging and I love um, picking berries, going out there. It reminds me of the happy times as I'm growing up at the same time. Um, it reminds me of um, just how beautiful our foods are. While there were plenty of other game to hunt and fish, other foods needed to be gathered too. Berries, nuts, fruits, herbs, mix them all together and you get an amazing meal. Indigenous communities that practiced were sure to not take more than what they needed because those foods that they gathered were also ingested by the animals around them. And so this is where I find, especially here at Wapi Paws Kitchen, where I find everybody does come here to gather. If people don't have those connections with the berries or the blue corn or even the bison, for instance, or even the deer, and when they do come, it really um, has those, triggers those beautiful memories as if they were um, in their grandmother's place. You know, you could be a home away from home, and that's why this place is here. Initiatives like this kitchen here are just one effort to bring traditional recipes back to popularity. Whether it's blue corn mush, choke cherry pudding, smoked salmon, or bison stew, these recipes and these food ways are key to how indigenous peoples have survived and maintained cultural connections throughout the centuries. I guess for indigenous communities, innovation starts in the kitchen. Okay, while I'd love to stay and drop some more food sovereignty knowledge on y'all, I'm very hungry after watching Chef Wapapa throw down in the kitchen. But before I go, have you ever tried an indigenous recipe? Have you ever been to an indigenous restaurant? Let me know in the comments. Until next time. Happy Earth Month, everybody. All month, PBS is dropping new content to celebrate our amazing planet. I wanted to highlight an episode of State of Change. It's about individual citizens taking action against climate change. Links to that video and the full Earth Month playlist are in the description.